I'm Deborah Cohn. I am the John Winthrop Wright Director of Ethical Education here at Character.org. And thank you to our viewers for joining us for your interest in the Ethics in Action series. This series is made possible by the School for Ethical Education, and we thank them as always for the support of this important work. I'd like to welcome Dr. Jason Stevens, who is Associate Professor of, in the School of Learning, Development, and Professional Practice at the University of Auckland. His primary research interests include human motivation, ethical functioning, cheating behavior, and the promotion of academic integrity during adolescence. He's the co-author of two books, Educating Citizens and Creating a Culture of Academic Integrity, as well as numerous journal articles and other publications related to these interests. Jason co-authored this book, um, which I just mentioned, Creating a Culture of Academic Integrity, a toolkit for secondary schools with Dr. David Wangard from the School for Ethical Education. And I repeatedly hear Jason's name and his research referenced often at the International Center for Academic Integrity. So thank you, Jason, for being part of this Ethics in Action series. And let me start by asking, how, how did you find this research focus? How did you get interested in this work? Ah, well, that first, thank you, uh, Deborah. Delighted to be here. Uh, you know, honored to be a part of this uh, this series. That seems uh, terrific. Um, yeah, I uh, I was a doctoral student at uh, at Stanford University and uh, studying with uh, Ann Colby and, uh, and and among others. And um, we were on a project that led to the educating citizens work. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, and it was in that context actually that um, we were traveling around the country and visiting um, at, at various colleges and universities um, that seemed to really take seriously their mission about promoting. Um, a, a, moral and civic responsibility um, uh, mm -hmm. uh, among their undergraduates. And, uh, and I believe we were on, a, uh, on our way to Duke University. And at the time, Duke University uh, was, uh, was home for the center for what was then the, just the Center for Academic Integrity, I believe. Um, and that's now the International Center for Academic Integrity. And, uh, and I had already had an interest in, um, uh, of course, you know, moral reasoning, moral development, uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, and I hadn't really thought about it much in the context of academic integrity. Um, but as I was preparing for this visit, um, I began to read uh, research on, 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 on academic misconduct, as it were, and, uh, and realized that, uh, you know, that most students believed that cheating was wrong, right? That they, that they saw it as, as even morally wrong, uh, but nonetheless um, found themselves doing it. Um, and I thought that was particularly interesting, you know, and especially as somebody who was um, in a program called Psychological Studies in Education, um, mm -hmm. this, uh, what, it, what is known as this judgment action gap in moral psychology, they talk about the judgment action gap, that people um, uh, can reason and make judgments about what they ought to do, uh, but then maybe find themselves uh, behaving in ways um, uh, that are um, incongruent, right, inconsistent mm -hmm. with that belief. And so I thought that uh, yeah, academic misconduct, in a way, offered um, a, a really interesting instantiation of this judgment action gap. Um, and uh, and it was you know in the context of that that I decided to make it the really the centerpiece of my um, of my uh, doctoral thesis, uh, which was titled "Just Cheating?" Question um, mark. And uh, uh, what is it? Motivation, morality, and misconduct among adolescents. Um, and the idea there with this just cheating was sort of a double entendre, right? Are, are students doing it because they, yeah, oh, it's just cheating, right? It's no big deal. Uh, or it's just because of there's a sense that I'm, I'm right for doing this. You know, these uh, teachers are bad or unfair or this situation is unfair. And, uh, and so I really meant this sort of just cheating in a couple of different ways. I'm afraid I don't think I really developed that as well as I might have in the thesis, and, and I think it's a, a kind of an ongoing project, if you will. I do think there are students who really feel righteous and justified in their cheating, um, and, I, and, and there are definitely those that um, think that it's, you know, minimize it and think that, oh, it's just cheating, it's no big deal. Um, mm -hmm. It's not like I'm hurting anybody, you know, right? Uh, and uh, and then there are those kind of in the, uh, I think in the, more in the middle, um, but uh, 
uh, but yeah, the, the the research goes back now, uh, and, and the interest anyway was sparked uh, well, now some 20 years ago. <laughs> and, wow. Um, and uh, yeah, and it has it sustained me. And of course, in the in the last few years, uh, uh, yeah, new challenges uh, have, have arose as we've as we've gone into a pandemic situation and the lockdown right. and assessment moving online, and of course, uh, technology ever developing and um, you know people um, uh, uh, finding and being presented with and even sold new ways to um, to misrepresent what they know and know how to do uh, I all a contract cheating so uh, the right. uh, the problem I'm afraid hasn't gotten any better indeed um, arguably worse yeah it's really it's very interesting that you bring up contract cheating because um, and that that is something that I wasn't familiar with um, I, I knew, of course, because having been in a university setting, you know, the big the big thing was, oh, well, if you join this club, then you'll have access to the mm -hmm. test file. Right. That was a that was a thing when I was in college. And of course, they were all paper tests. And um, and I remember thinking, why do we want that? You know, but in the meantime, now those test files are of course digital and now you can buy all of these things test files and papers and all of that online and that's what we refer to now as contract cheating which is mm -hmm. that third party online well i guess usually online these days right is there i suppose it yeah, could be uh, contract cheating in person right well you know i mean contract cheating yeah it, it's probably existed for millennia you know in the sense of sort of yeah. this informal as you're saying you know through it used to be just more of a face-to-face -face thing social groups there were essay mills you know right that were you know very locally run on campuses and um right. and uh, even you know uh, uh, you know fraternity sorority especially groups you know t tended to have more access to these things because i was at university in the 1980s and remember it very well um it, what we have now of course is yeah commercial contract cheating Right, right, where it's a, it's a corporate entity, you know, a for-profit organization, um, and uh, yeah, you you uh, of course you probably wouldn't have that, um, uh, at least not to the scale we do without without the internet. Um, one yeah. of the one of the many, uh, yeah, uh, and so uh, yeah, there's a, it happens in a number of ways. There are of course the the ones that are you know that'll write bespoke essays for you, right? Um, even mm -hmm. including doctoral thesis, um, and they're really oh I'm afraid gosh. not that. They don't even cost that much money, unfortunately, right? I mean, even a student with reasonable means can, you know, pay for to have a a, a five page, a twenty page essay generated for them, um, really in a matter of uh, in less than a day or several days. You pay a premium, of course, for um, shorter windows and so forth. Uh, and then, of course, there are the Chegs and the course heroes and the ones that, in a way, are uh, engaging in a, a bit of an illegal activity in the sense that um, uh, to gain admission sometimes, or one way to gain admission to these sites is to um, provide lecturer materials or test, which oh is copyrighted goodness. material, mind you, right? The, those lecture notes, any tests, any stuff like that, students are allowed to use um, uh, the download and use for personal purposes only. They are not allowed to then subsequently distribute those or upload them into, you know, um, some website in exchange for gaining access, right? Um, and so in this sense, I, I, I believe some of these companies are anyway, um, you know, engaging in, uh, in a perpetuating copyright violation. Um, wow, I didn't even realize It's not my area of expertise. Level. Right. Yeah, yeah, no. yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I, but I run into it. I'm the academic academic integrity advisor here at the University of uh, of Auckland, or one of them anyway. And for, for my right. faculty, um, there's about fifty of us across the whole university. Um, uh, and um, I've just run into a, a case last week that involved that. Um, uh, and hmm. so, uh, you know, we're we're constantly confronting you know various iterations of this contract cheating um, uh, enterprise, as it were. Uh, and wow. then, of course, just straight up, the most common behaviors now are really uh, plagiarism and collusion, uh, because of especially now with the majority of assessment being online and, and even more um, written is uh, is students, of course, you know, doing the old cut and fat, uh, cut and paste plagiarism cut and paste. Um, from, from right. websites, not contracting it, doing it themselves. 
uh, and uh, and of course uh, collusion, working with others uh, when they're not supposed to, because again, a lot of this assessment is now online. Uh, you know, and students are uh, it's become invisible. <laughs> you know, you you right. know we're not we're really testing students in classrooms anymore um, and maybe we'll return to that uh, but right now it's very quite easy for students to um, you know ring each other up or communicate right. through platforms like discord or even whatsapp uh, you know any any social media platform um, uh, that uh, yeah where they can exchange ideas and opinions as it were or answers uh, uh, you know online uh, quite readily so it's a, yeah it's a new wow. frontier which in a way, you know, uh, you know, gets to this issue of character, of course, um, you know, right? right? Because if we can't, we, you know, you can't possibly control everything in the environment. I mean, we never could, uh, but, you know, the oftentimes assessment was done by, right, putting people in a room, you know, creating space between them, generating alternative um, uh, versions of the exam, uh, yeah. you know, right, and, uh, and, and uh, you know, making sure that students didn't bring any, bring in any technology or, or cheat sheets in the old-fashioned sense, and so you could really um, control quite a bit, right, of, of the testing environment, as it were, to make sure that you were uh, assessing what the the individual and only that individual knew, uh, yeah. but it's really not not like that. At least, at least, still here in the. I know we're. I, I hope past the peak, of the crest of this pandemic, and, and things are starting to, you know, return to some kind of new normal. Um, but I think part of that new normal is, um, uh, you know, a, assessment being run online increasingly, and us leaving it right, um, uh, to the integrity, as it were, the character of the individual uh, to mm -hmm. not, um, uh, you know, to not uh, violate the, the rules um, and, and, and engage in whether it's, uh, you know, some form of plagiarism, contract cheating, collusion, any kind of misconduct. Um, and so, uh, so, yeah, that's where we're at right now. I think that in, in, a, in a certain sense, you know, character matters more than ever. Um, you know, uh, as we live in this, you know, really more, more and more of a technology mediated world, right, where people right. can, um, uh, you know, do things and even get away with things a lot easier uh, uh, than they could in, in, a, in a more face to face world. Mm -hmm. Right. A, an online test book is much different than a blue book, a printed blue book, which mm -hmm. is what I wrote in in college, you know eons ago and um it was a lot harder yeah how 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 could you forge that when you're sitting in front of the professor writing you know multiple blue books for your answers on an exam so um so that but that leads me to to a question so i've read a lot about what's been going on since the pandemic as far as um you know how organizations, universities, as well as K-12 schools have been increasing their, um, uh, for lack of a better term, their, their regulatory systems for monitoring academic integrity. How much has that seemed to, to be changing? And do you think those things are here to stay? It sounds like from what you're saying, maybe they are, because I don't know that online school is is really going away 100 percent anymore yeah i think uh, there's a lot of uh, of course conveniences and benefits associated with it i um, mean and particularly when people are ill whether you know regardless of a pandemic you know um and uh, you know just your pedestrian flu and you're able to stay home but yet still you know have access um that said there's plenty of research to suggest that it's not optimal um, mm -hmm. Right. In terms of learning gains and so forth that, you know, that really we 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 do learn best when we are, you know, in, in a person, class right. and working with others in person. And so um, I, I hope that, uh, you know, that we will leave a we'll, we'll yeah, we'll strike some kind of balance that is of, of harnessing, you know, what what is good about the technology and online access um, and uh, and but yet maintaining a strong, you know, place-based um, education uh, as well as assessment of that education. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, yeah, the, uh, 
you know, I don't know much, you know, you, your question sounds more like a policy one and, and that gets a little bit out of my, mm. um, you know, my wheelhouse as it were, um, you know, but I, uh, I do know a, a bit about that in the sense of, you know, what universities are doing. I mean, we're still here in Auckland and in New Zealand more broadly, and I, I, and I think a lot of other places, yeah, we're still doing a lot of online assessment and we're doing some, you know, getting some of it's being done with that um, invigilate where you can proctor or invigilate an exam online. That technology mm -hmm. has a lot of problems though, and raises a lot of questions about, about, about privacy um, and about mm. um, even discrimination in terms of the technology and what it can and cannot pick up. And um, there's, you know, pending lawsuits. Now I just read about one in Florida, right. Where somebody oh, wow. was just, looking down a little bit, you know, and because um, she was uh, reportedly just thinking, right? And you you need to keep your eyes on the screen the whole time. Any deviation of eye movement from your screen during a two-hour testing time is flagged, right, um, as potential misconduct. Um, and so, uh, you wow. know, so a lot of, yeah. The, so this, um, you know, kind of Orwellian technology, if you will, that can be employed, right you know, right, if you wanted to make, you know, online assessment full time and, and have it proctored, you know, is that we, we increasingly have the technology to do that. Um, uh, but it's um, increasingly kind of invasive in, in demanding mm -hmm. in a way that goes beyond just testing what the student knows about the content at hand, right? It becomes a concentration task, right? And, a, exactly. and, a, and a one of being disciplined of not, you know, not, you know, not deviating one's gaze from the screen. And so it's, right. um, it's a, a bit perverse, uh, quite frankly, I think. And so, um, again, there may be times and places where that has to be used, uh, but I would like to see that minimized. Um, I would, I, again, would, yeah. I would like to see uh, policymakers, administrators, right, um, work to, um, uh, in so much as possible, um, getting us back to place-based, you know, right, face-to-face -face real mm -hmm. learning where, where we have that, we, we, that, that human contact, because that is really critical in how we learn, um, both our, yeah. our motivation, our engagement, all of that um, happens best in real time. You know, you wouldn't want, it's like raising a child, right? A young child, you wouldn't do right. that, you know, remote digitally, even if you could, right? You would just right. put her in the room upstairs. I've got a, I've got a two-year-old in full disclosure, <laughs> right? And then, and then let all, all of your inter all your nurturing and interaction of her be sort of mediated through technology. That'd be insane. Um, right. That would not optimize developmental outcomes, um, character yeah. or otherwise, uh, so, right. uh, you know, we need to understand that, yes, that technology is, can be incredible, uh, has some uh, terrific efficiencies um, and benefits, uh, but also recognize its limitations. Um, and that some things are worth paying for, right? I think you, you worry with policymakers and administrators sometimes that they're just looking at the bottom line, right? What's going to be the most cost-effective way to do this um, in mm -hmm. making decisions based on that? rather than on you know what the what the what the real the, what really counts um and that is you know exactly. right, educational developmental outcomes so i i do worry that you know that once we've um, taken a, a, a bite of this apple <laughs> you know um and uh, you know it, it is sort right. of hard to go back you know right i mean right that, that how is, far will we know, go yeah yeah, yeah. so exactly uh, interesting well and it's it's also interesting because i've been reading a lot about what teachers can do. So I taught middle school. So my students were anywhere from, you know, late 10 years old to 14 and um, kind of prime time for figuring out who they are and, and how they're supposed to be acting to be good students, right? And to do school well and properly. And, um, and so it was interesting because one of the things that that surprised me when I would talk to students about um, cheating. And at this time, it was really, for me, I taught a lot of courses in research. So the cheating that I saw was mostly plagiarism. And mm -hmm. what I learned is that even though I would have a discussion with them about plagiarism and they'd all nod very dutifully and tell me that they knew what plagiarism was, um, that's not necessarily the case. And I think, I think it's important, especially for teachers in the, the K-12 environment, to make sure that they, they bring that out and they're really clear about that because 
it's it's so easy for students like you said you know they might be doing work online and then they just cut and paste and and if you're not citing that i used to talk to my students about if you're not citing that and you're not giving credit where credits do you're actually stealing and that mm -hmm. is not being and not demonstrating academic integrity so that was something that really as a teacher was very surprising to me how we talk about it but i'm not sure that we intentionally teach into that with young students young children so that they can grow up understanding exactly what it is when we talk about academic integrity and we talk about plagiarism and cheating and all of those terms mm -hmm. that we sort of throw around but i don't know that we we really fully define for them have you found that when you've worked with teachers and when you've when you've done your research yeah, uh, absolutely. And, you know, I mean, plagiarism is a, a particularly difficult one, right? Because of it, it is, um, you know, for, especially for uh, young, uh, uh, young, I say adolescents, or in your case, even just older children, you know, right? And trying to get yeah. your, hand, your head around the concept of intellectual property, you know, right? And right. what does exactly. that mean? Because it's, it's not just like, you know, copying words verbatim, right? That can be fairly easy to understand. Then there's this broader idea of taking somebody's ideas, Right. right or even their organizational structure right and using that right that that itself is intellectual property right it's sort of like you know the rhythm of a song or the the chord progression right these things are all mm -hmm. things that are you know uh, are are part of a, of a of a creation of somebody right an artist and and, uh, and and have copyright protection um so you just can't you know rip off the the the, the you know whether it's the lyrics or the tune right um both right. are protected and so you you and that's a tough one for kids and so um and and even for even for young adults quite frankly you know at the university level you know working with graduate students as i do is of getting this idea of 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 yeah, of intellectual property and what that encompasses, you know, um, mm -hmm. uh, beyond verb, you know, verbatim, you know, um, verbiage, uh, right, uh, right, words. It's uh, the, the idea of I ideas and, and knowledge, and then um, and then along with that, then of course is is the skills, uh, right? You know, to uh, so let's say I even want to sort of re I respect and value that, that this is somebody else's words or ideas. Um, you know, uh, I, I need a I need a great deal of skill to be able to either paraphrase that stuff correctly, right? Use it appropriately, right? And and pay mm -hmm. proper attribution, as we say, reference it. Mm -hmm. So there's a whole lot of skills that are that are really involved, at understanding and skills involved in um, uh, around plagiarism. That isn't true so much with like just copying from somebody, right? That's easy enough to say that, you know, don't copy from Johnny's test, you know, right? Right. Um, you know, right. right. It's, uh, it, it's, you know, right. There's not, there's not, not much to understand there or to avoid, right? It's pretty, it's a, it's a pretty clear, uh, it's pretty clear cut. Um, mm -hmm. But plagiarism is a lot trickier. Uh, you know, David and I, um, you know, with the, you mentioned the, um, uh, uh, the creating a culture of academic integrity and that um in that toolkit we do it's really a, a book a toolkit we 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 often called it um was a uh, a part of a templeton foundation project actually a, a, a templeton funded project that uh that we developed at the high school level it was very much in kind of a colbergian just community school um uh, tradition mm -hmm. of 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 getting students to take ownership so we think a big part of of really helping students understand, right? And not only just understand, I mean, you, you talked a lot about the understanding part, it's really committing to, right? To, to you know, to, to right. feeling themselves responsible for, right? I mean, you know, right? To really have character and integrity, right? Isn't just about the, the not having the moral knowledge, right? Um, it's also about having those skills I mentioned, but then you've got to have the commitment and in fact, you know, when people mm -hmm. talk about somebody of character a lot, what they're talking about is somebody who has the resolve, right? Who has the, the, the willpower to sort of stay with the right choice, even when that might, be, might not be the expedient thing. And it might even be, there mm -hmm. might even be a cost for it, right? A, a risk, uh, right? To, to not cheat. You know, it would have been easier to cheat. Um, and it might, have, it might have helped, you know, secure or guarantee me a better grade. But a person of character, they know the right thing. They know how to do the right thing, and they stay with it. So it's all right. of those they things, do it. and that 
and, and part of that commitment thing, what I'm getting at is in our programs, um, and, and I say our programs, because David and I really had two, we had this school-wide approach, which was the book you held up. And then we have yep. um, uh, 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 chapters and, uh, and journal articles we've written on what, um, what I call the Achieving with Integrity Seminar, which was mm -hmm. um, a high school initiative. Um, and uh, again, we're working mainly at the secondary level where the, the uh, where the problem of academic misconduct often blooms and students mm -hmm. really start to develop those habits, um, bad habits that is. And so we really um, you know, focused on those years as the important point of intervention. Um, but the point is, is that, you know, is, is that the, the seminar itself was about like raising awareness, right? we had that we used a kind of a four component model, again, out of a sort of a Kohlbergian tradition, neo Kohlbergian tradition, where in the first instance, we wanted students to recognize, you know, what, when, when is something a problem, right, for academic integrity, when might something be mm -hmm. cheating, be dishonest, right. Um, uh, and, um, and being able to be recognized that so that's like moral perception, moral awareness, um, sometimes called moral se ethical sensitivity, right? That that mm -hmm. is, I I see the moral in the situation, and so in a certain sense, that's the first thing that you know as, as we go about our lives, right? There's there's I think you know moral issues embedded everywhere in our choices, right? From the you know from the 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 veg we pick to the you know the vegetables we we choose at the at the market to the you know the the toilet paper we you know we choose, right? right. In some sense, you could say all of those are embedded with you know moral ethical choices, right? About about how those products are consumed, um, you know, uh, uh, and, and 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 produced and brought to market. Um, so the idea is to, you know, in the first instance, I think with 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 adolescents and, and young people is to help raise that awareness, right? Raising moral awareness so that they they understand that, hey, there's a moral issue involved here. And mm -hmm. then once once you see that, you know, then you're then you can move to the next step, if you will, of of thinking about, well, what should we do about that? What's the right thing to do in this situation? And that concerns, right, moral reasoning and moral judgment. So that's my second thing as a teacher. I want to, if I'm, if I'm thinking about you or any other buddy who's a, is a teacher in a classroom, right? It's like, let's help students recognize when there's this moral, aware, there's a moral issue at play. So that's the moral awareness. And then we can move to say, well, what's the right thing to do then? Now we see that there's mm -hmm. a moral issue here. What are our options and what would be the right thing to do and why? And, uh, and so you're, you're there, you're focusing on their moral reason and their judgment. And then once you have that sort of sorted, then you can move to the, the, the moral commitment, right? What's the, what the, uh, you know, what, what should, it's not just what should one do in the abstract of that, that, that sort of level two of reasoning and judgment. It's like, what are, what are your responsibilities? What should you do in this situation then? Right. You know, um, and, and, and that's, that, that's getting at that moral commitment. Um, and then as a final sort of thing, we, in, in the seminar series, we really built on the skills needed then to act on that, right, on that mm -hmm. commitment. So you've seen the problem, you've made a judgment about what, what should be done, you've, you, you, you've, you've, un, you've now committed to doing the right thing, you've said it's the right thing to do, and now I need the, now I need the skills. The actual, the, right. even the non-moral skills, uh, you know, uh, Tom Lacona and uh, Davidson, they talk about performance, moral character versus performance character, right? And this idea of that, you know, some of the, you know, you can't be a hero and jump in the water and save somebody who's drowning, which would be the, the right thing to do if you don't know how to swim. Right, you exactly. Know, right? You need the tools. Yeah. Right. You need the right. And the same thing is you can't, it's hard to avoid plagiarism, right? When you don't know how to reference, you don't know how to properly quote, you know how to do these things, you know, it's right. You, you know, there's there's a skill set often that's needed, right? Um, to, to act on our judgments. And I think we sometimes lose sight of that. And we haven't trained, mm -hmm. you know, right, taught students well enough. Um, but again, all of this, uh, you know, to, to sort of to just to recap these four processes, if you will, that I that I talked about awareness, judgment, commitment, action, you know, are a broader part of something called a, like a four component model of moral or ethical functioning. Um, mm -hmm. And, um, and that's, uh, I think that's really important. And especially when it comes to like, if we want to, to develop character writ large, it requires all of those components, right? Right. We, we can't be a character without, 
you know, right, a person of character um, uh, without those four, at least those four, and maybe some others that other that others might want to talk about, um, you know, being at play. Right. Um, so, right. Uh, yeah, so I think all that's really important, but I also want to say that, you know, um, I, I don't want to put it all on the person. I mean, right, you know, like, I, I, I think that we have to recognize that um, the situation matters, that culture matters, and that we, the adult, we, teachers and the adults, administrators, new, need to do a lot more by way of creating cultures of integrity, right, and, and, and reducing those temptations um, and those opportunities. So it has to be both, mm -hmm. right? You know, I I'm I'm really was rooted in sort of social psychology a bit. You know, when I was working on my PhD, I minored in social psychology as well, and very much believe in that idea of the power of the situation, and that any um, that any behavior or action is really a product of the the person kind of times the environment. Uh, it's Kurt Lewin's famous dictum, right? That mm -hmm. uh, behavior is a function of the person times the environment. Of course, John Dewey said that as well. You know, that, that Mer Dewey, you know, Dewey in 1919, I, um, I can't remember the title of the book, talked about, said, you know, morality is not something mysteriously cooped up in personality. It is always a product of, of, of the person and the culture together interacting. Mm -hmm. um, the society, and, and I, right. Yeah. And of course, Hart, Shorn, and May's, you know, classical studies in deceit in the 19, uh, late 20s showed that, right? That they looked at kids who were honest, Right. They didn't they weren't they didn't they wouldn't tell lies, but yet then they they they, they were, you know, cheating on the test uh, or they were right. you know, stealing over here. And they you know, they showed that this there wasn't this consistency across people. Um, we want to believe that. Right. We want to believe that, oh, somebody is good and, 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 and they're good here. They're good everywhere. And the, unfortunately, the in, in, yeah, empirical research does not bear that out, that, that we are all sub we are all. Uh, subject that is to, uh, 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 to to being dishonest at some point and in some ways, in some situations at some point in our lives, you know, right? I think that's just a part of being human, um, right? And, uh, and so, uh, and that's where we need the help and the support of the environment and the culture and the situation that we're in. Um, because mm. of, we do all have that, uh, we all, we, we all can be tempted, um, and, uh, and, um, and we need, uh, we need help and support to be good. Um, right. I, I just was reading something. Um, I don't think it was one of your articles, but I think you contributed to it. It was an article from Edutopia from a few years back. And I think mm, you're, yep. you're quoted in it. And it talked about the fact that the teachers can help to create a culture where maybe there are fewer high stakes assessments. Maybe we don't put so much pressure on, you know, the final exam, right? Maybe it, it becomes something where we have periodic assessments and we are doing things that lower the stakes so that number one we you know we we already know that students are stressed out to their eyeballs these days right i mean kids have always been stressed to different levels but it seems that stress right now for students um, especially with a lot of pandemic learning loss is a little bit different and so i i was reading this article and thinking about the fact that you know yes maybe teachers can help by creating a culture where if you don't have these high stakes assessments, if you um, you change the way that you are administering these exams, these tests, that that can help students feel less of a need to cheat, which I think speaks to the whole idea of, you know, the culture, the society that you were just talking about, um, that we've created, have we created an environment that that leads to dishonest academic behavior or are we sort of helping students to get out of their own way in that way um yeah. does that sound logical yeah ab absolutely no there's a number of things there that i that uh yeah that uh, uh that what you said g gives rise to a lot of thoughts um you know yeah and, and it's <laughs> it is really about yeah what how are we creating the environment right the experience of the student and so you know right uh, you know, we shouldn't have final exams, for instance, that are worth 50% of your grade even, 
Um, you know, the, here right. at the University of Auckland, it's kind of a, there's still a lot of the British system here. And there are, you know, some exams that are worth like 60%, you know, right, of somebody's oh. final grade, which is, you know, that's a, that creates a lot of pressure. Um, and, and pressure creates then temptation. Um, so, uh, you know, my, I just had my final exam last week and, you know, it's worth 40%, which is still very high. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, but then we also have the case where if a student has, you know, um, two exams in a day, we can, we can reschedule a little bit. So, you know, creating a system where we can create alternative time. So that way students aren't overburdened, you know, um, with, with, with multiple, you know, major assessments in, in, in one day. Um, mm -hmm. And then more generally, you know, it's, it's what are we, you know, really communicating to students, you know, when we talk about assessment, you know, and what is it for, right, um, uh, we really want to be in a position of saying that, you know, that, yeah, that a lot of the, the aim of assessment is to uh, help not only us know, you know, how you're doing, um, but for you to know, and so that way we can, you can, you can build further, it's, it's, it's the kind of a, the, you know, formative assessment as it's often known, right? Where right. It's, it's used as information, right? Um, and, uh, to to uh, provide feedback um, and, uh, and, and, and provide a, a plan for going forward. Um, of course, we don't do that very well and final exams aren't necessarily, they're, they're more summative <laughs> assessment. Um, uh, right. But, uh, but yeah, there's lots of things that, that, that we can do, right? Yeah, to, to minimize um, the pressures and stress associated with, uh, you know, exams and other forms of assessment. Um, and I think that, that those are certainly important. Uh, you know, there, there's always going to be some degree of stress and pressure, of course, you know, taking a test and right. so we're not going to eliminate it completely, but, you know, we do have to, you know, make it reasonable. Um, and we have mm -hmm. to provide um, ways of, uh, you know, when, when, when other things are going on in people's lives, Right. We have a lot of students here, you know, just like any other university that are having a hard time these days. Right. The students with a lot of presenting with a lot of mental health problems or maybe family mm -hmm. challenges, addiction, death um, and uh, even domestic abuse. I mean, you know, in, in creating um, uh, we call it agritat here or compassionate consideration. So that there's mm -hmm. means for like if they have to miss an assessment. Right. Um, even an important test. Um, there's, uh, they can apply for this uh, compassionate consideration and, um, and, uh, you know, we can do any number of things, allow for a, a resit of the exam, for instance, mm -hmm. create an alternative assessment, or in some cases, even just, you know, um, impute a grade, you know, based on, um, their other performance. So, uh, right. you know, and I think especially now with, yeah, the, the, crisis as acute as it can be, um, both physical health and mental health with students, you know, uh, universities and schools need to have these mechanisms, um, these policies and mechanisms in place um, in order to mm -hmm. help take off the pressure and, of course, making their students aware of it. We have a very generous, um, excuse me, um, policy with respect to late assignments here that, you know, and most of our students don't even seem to know it, that, you know, right, if you miss a deadline, you, you have a week and you only get a 10% reduction in your mark. Mm -hmm. So that, you know, that's designed, especially for writing assignments. You know, um, most of the students who I talk to who've plagiarized, it's like they didn't even realize, you know, that, that I just could have taken another week. Um, instead, I panicked and started cutting and pasting things from the internet right. so I could meet the deadline when, it, you know, had they, you know, just let the deadline pass and, it, you know, they had a week and it would only cost them 10%, which is marginal, right? right? Especially uh, compared to a, a charge of academic misconduct and, uh, and so forth and the penalties associated right. with it. That's really interesting. And, and that also makes me think of, um, you know, teachers who will give an assignment and mostly this would be for those formative assessments, those periodic assessments, not for that, that uh, end of class summative assessment, but um, they would give an assignment. And if a student doesn't perform as well as he or she is looking to perform, give them the opportunity to retake, to, to go ahead and redo the work to demonstrate their learning rather than focusing on that particular grade. And I'm not sure how that works out with academic integrity, 
but I think maybe that could help students feel a little bit less of the pressure, perhaps. Yeah. To well, it's about communicating. Right? What, yeah, you know what I what I always say to my students, you know, um, is that you know I want you to learn, right? It's about we, we you know in motivation. We talk about sort of goal theory and motivation. We call it a mastery goal. Uh, you know, right. we want we want them to adopt mastery goals. To, to basically feel like and, and to communicate mastery goals. So it, you know, adoption of goal of student adopting a mastery goal, right, requires that the that the teacher and the broader sort of um, learning environment is communicating the importance of mastery goals. Mastery goals are these self-referenced goals of me getting smarter, more able, right? It's about developing mm -hmm. competence, you know, right? Rather than simply demonstrating it looking smart, right? Or not looking right. stupid. Was there approach or right. avoidance strivings of, of, of goals? Well, we want students to really adopt these mastery goals and not just the what's called performance goals, sometimes called ego goals of just, mm -hmm. you know, looking good and doing well or extrinsic goals of, you know, just getting the grade. What I want for my right. students, and I'm really, I'm really adamant about communicating that across a, across a semester is that um, always ask yourself, are you, are you learning more? Are you, you know, right? Are you developing, you know, an understanding, getting more competent in terms of, uh, you know, whether it's understanding ideas or, or using particular skills, um, uh, whatever is, whatever it is related to your sort of particular content area or discipline, um, make yeah. that the focus and, and, and let assessment really be about, again, providing feedback as to how I'm developing learning. Don't worry about your neighbor next to you, right? Or how the rest of the class is doing. That doesn't matter. What matters is that right. you're learning, you're right. growing, you're developing. That's the goal. That should be the, everybody's goal. And we spend too much time in education and assessment, right? You know, ranking students and, and creating these hierarchies and these bell curves and, um, and even, you know, uh, 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 having a ceremonies to make them public. And again, that's not all bad. You know, you, 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 you want to you want to recognize and reward your, you know, uh, your, your honor students, I suppose, but, re but you always have to remember that that does come at a cost <laughs> as well, right? Right. What does it communicate to the, to everybody else, you know? Um, and so I think we have to balance these things out. I'm not saying we get rid of, you know, rid of those things, but it's, uh, we have to be careful with them. And we mm -hmm. want the overall, in, in, you know, when we think about the totality of, of messaging, right, that we communicate and values that we communicate, they need to be on, on helping each individual grow and make the most of their, of their talents and, and abilities um, mm -hmm. and, and not, not put them into a pecking order, um, right? Right. And ranking them. Right. Which Honoring the I, I individual. Think that's Right, and, and I, I used to talk about students' gifts and gaps, and we need to honor all of it. And, you know, everybody is different, and that's terrific. And we need to help them focus on their, their skills that they can develop and developing them in a real way, not in a, a disingenuous way, I guess, is what I'm thinking. Right. Um, yeah, and so what we're talking how... about here is this idea that, you know, right, that, it you know, Preventing cheating, you know, in a, in a certain sense, isn't about just like, you know, right, you know, standing over a student and, and preventing it, right? It's about creating right. a, a culture and set of values that maybe themselves even aren't directly, you wouldn't think directly related to cheating. They're not, you know, right? But you know, helping, making, helping students feel like they're valuable as individuals and that right. what you want for them is for them to grow and learn. If that's my, if that's my goal orientation, then cheating becomes um, uh, antithetical to that, right? It's like you wouldn't even think about that, right? There's no, it's like then it would, it, cheating would actually mess that up in a way, right? It would give me a false read right. on my progress. And so, you know, um, I, that, that's what we're talking about. When we talk about creating a culture of integrity, you know, right? It's, it's really about creating a value system um, that uh, both, both directly, but often indirectly, right, um, has implications for one's, one's, one's choices and behaviors. Um, mm. And, uh, and so that's, uh, I, I think that's what we really have to do, you know, right? I, I, I don't think, I don't like the, I like the idea of promoting integrity, not preventing cheating. 
right? I mean, that's when I yes. when I think of myself, right. like, and what I what I what I'm in the you know what, what I aim to do in my scholarship and my work these days, you know, right? Um, well, it was never to prevent cheating. It was initially for me. My I spent the first half of my career to date, you know, really trying to understand cheating. You know, right? Why do students do it? What's going on in their heads? And you know, how are they? getting past this gap, as it were, and we can talk about that, of, um, you know, this mm. judgment action gap. Um, and then really the second half, you know, the last, the last five, 10 years, thinking about how can we promote integrity? Um, and then in doing so, right, yeah, you know, mitigate, you know, the amount of cheating that we get, but it's not about preventing cheating. Um, I'm in the, I'm in the business right. of, of, of promoting academic integrity and doing so through both helping the individual become more aware and more committed as we talked about and more skilled, um, but also about creating environments uh, that are more conducive to achieving with integrity. Mm, I like that. I like the, the positive approach to it rather than focusing on the negative. Um, definitely. I feel like we could talk about this on and on and on, which we can't really do because um, we don't want people to tune out. Um, but I did want to ask you, so we've talked a lot about teachers. I'm thinking about the parents of my former students. And I know parent support was was really a big factor for this. So just briefly, what can parents do to help support their students as they are working towards mastery and really learning subjects for real rather than getting certificates and ribbons and awards and grades and all of those sorts of things and yeah. focusing on that that yeah, piece of achievement. Well exactly that, you know, right? I think I think parents have to ask themselves, you know, what do they really want for their child? You know, mm -hmm. is 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 it, you know, is it to get the ribbon, you know, or is it, you know, genuine learning and growth? you know, right? right, and not not for themselves to be obsessed with with a letter grade, you know, right, or or a test score, um, but rather, uh, you know, to be, I, 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 cause to me that that's just, in a way that's the superficial stuff. I, I think right. that, you know, what parents need to do is they need to be more genuinely involved, um, right? And to be understanding, you know, what, what they're, and I know that, you know, some parents, uh, you know, uh, some have more or less time, you know, right? And so, I, mm -hmm. you know, for what you, a parent has to ask themselves, well, what's sort of appropriate and possible for them? Um, but certainly, um, I, I, it is about being um, involved and engaged and taking an interest in what your student is learning and doing. Um, mm. And um, having these, you know, much like what I talked about with teachers, you know, wh where where it presents itself, you know, um, the, the, the parent, of course, is the the you know is the first you know character educator right of their child um right uh, you know of course some people uh you know right don't want teachers at all involved in character education which is a, kind of absurd because of it's it's uh, it's unavoidable um uh, right uh and so uh but for them to have the to, to you know to help their you know with, with respect to their child to help their student you know when they when they see that they're in a situation right a, and I, I say a moral situation an ethical or moral dilemma having to make a choice right between mm -hmm. doing something that is uh you know well i don't say good or bad i don't want to use those kind of more pejorative but you know this idea of you know right and wrong or better or worse you know right a moral choice a choice that has moral consequences you know right mm -hmm. that they really make sure that their kid's aware, right? That this is, you know, right, this is a, this is a moral decision. And what, what, what values, right, or, um, or principles are you going to, you know, prioritize? Because that's what it comes down to, right? right? It comes down to like a lot of times when you make, you're making that commitment that we talked about, right? As I can see that, oh, cheating would be the wrong thing to do. It would be, it would be right for me to be fair and to be honest. Because if I cheat, then that's disadvantaging others who are who are behaving honestly, and that would be wrong for me to do. Um, but now I've got to make that commitment. And I said, "Whoa, right. I want to do better than others, though. That's that's important to me, right? I want to get that high test score, and I want to be able to, you know, get into the good college or university, right, and get the good job and the big house and what, you know, right? And they can think about that, right? And it's like." Um, you know, but they need to prioritize, right, you know, the ethical over the expedient, as I like to sort of mm. talk about it, right, because that's yeah. often what it comes down to, is that, you know, ethics um, loses to expediency, 
that we mm -hmm. do the quick and easy thing, the thing that's going to get us to the goal state faster and, um, you know, and, 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 and leave ethics at the roadside. Um, you know, to get right. down that road with expediency. So that that's right. the big problem. And, and parents are critical here because if we are, of course, first and foremost, as I say, the, the character educators, and how are we the character educators? Through modeling, through our own mm -hmm. choices and our own actions, right? And our own capacity to, to, to be aware and to reflect and to make those judgments. Um, and, and we need to be doing that with our children. Right, you know, uh, Vygotsky and uh, you know, social culturals talk about sort of a cognitive apprenticeship. I think that's a, a mm. Robert Rogoff's term. But um, you know, the idea of engaging our students um, and, and, sh and showing them the thinking that goes on, you know, when confronted with an ethical dilemma, um, and, and being models, as it were, of of these thinking processes, and and to say that you know, sometimes yeah, it's hard. But you've got to prioritize, right? You know the the you know the 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 doing you know doing the good over the getting ahead, right? The ethics right, and over that the is speed. how they. Yeah, right. Exactly. I cut you off, but yes, ethics over expediency, and that's how they'll develop those skills, which is that fourth component that you talked about. Yeah, that is so necessary to actualize all of this. Yeah. No. It, it yeah. takes it, it takes uh, it takes practice to, of course. <laughs> Uh, to resist temptation, right? To uh, to have right. that ego strength, um, as some of it sometimes called, right? Um, to resist the temptation, um, and um, I think that's a, a large part of of to me again of being a when you say a person of character, right? It really mm -hmm. is somebody that has this resolve to act in accord with their judgment. That's integrity to me. Integrity means many things, right? Integrity. Talk about integrity is as. as People sometimes just translate it you know, simply as honesty or truth, right? Um, but mm -hmm. to me, it's in, in, in integration, right? Integrity is it, what's integral is things that are integrated, and that and that integration is the judgment and the action. When you're a person of mm -hmm. integrity, you are there. There's a wholeness. That's another sort of definition of integrity, right? What is that wholeness? There's a wholeness between what you believe and what you do, um, right? And that you know, that takes, that, that's not easy oftentimes, no. right? That, that takes strength. Um, it takes this, this character strength, this, uh, this ego strength, this, this will, this perseverance in the face of temptation and even difficulties um, to stay the course and do the right thing when cheating, dishonesty, stealing, whatever it might be, um, w w w might, you know, might, might be an easier road um, uh, you know, to, to the goods that you want. Um, right. Right. Wow. Okay. We've gotten into some really deep philosophical stuff and <laughs> I think that's terrific. That's, that's really good. That's why I love these conversations. And, um, like I said, I feel like we could continue talking about this. Maybe we need a part two. I think yeah. we might have to, well, we might have to do this again. Cause I can see us talking about the next stage and the next phase for everyone. I think, um, though, I do have to say before we sign off, there's one last thing yeah. about w whether it's parents or teachers, institutions that, that we need to do a lot more of. And that is, you know, that you hear about teachable moments, right? Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, so, you know, even when we do all of the, the best things we can to prepare our students and to educate them and, and to try to help them make, you know, you know, be aware and make the good choices and do the right thing, you know, it's inevitable that, we, that we're all going to fall short sometimes. And we need to be there um, and respond with, with not um, uh, Tricia uh, Bertam Gallant, uh, you know, great colleague of mine at the University of California, San Diego, um, which by the way, does one of the best jobs at this, is, 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 is making, um, uh, you know, breaches of integrity a teachable moment. And so mm. we just wrote an article um, about a year or two ago called um, Punishment is Not Enough um, and advocating for what we call a developmental approach, right? Or what's known as an educational or developmental approach. So when your student or your child, you know, falls short and does something dishonest, they lie, they steal, they cheat, you know, whatever it is, is to, is not just to simply punish them. Maybe some degree of punishment might be necessary. Um, uh, I'm not entirely against that, but I, but I am against 
punishment without education. Um, I think first right. and foremost, it is to make this a teachable moment, have them reflect on what they did, um, have them understand um, why, you know, that it's wrong and why it's wrong. And finally, mm -hmm. um, that what would you do differently? So when we do interviews mm -hmm. with students who have been caught cheating here, it's, it's very much not only helping them understand what they did and, and why it was wrong um, and having them to sort of own that, right? To take ownership of our mistakes, um, but then also to think about what, how could this have come out differently, right? And mm -hmm. really engage your child or your student in understanding that other paths were available. What could have, you know, so if you're in the situation again, you know, what, what could you do, right? That would, you know, besides cheat or be dishonest in a way, you know, right? And so really playing that out. So uh, yeah, that's just my final thing. I just would, I would be remiss not to make sure that we covered no. that we, part of developing yeah. character is responding to, um, yeah, shortcomings, right? To, to, to our mistakes in making those right. teachable moments. Right, I like that. I talk about teachable moments all the time. Thank you for bringing that up. That's great. And thank you, Jason. This is this has really been a terrific conversation. And, um, you know, I'll look forward to part two at some point. I would love it. Thank you for the opportunity, Deborah. Great to see you and uh, best wishes with this great project you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. And we'll talk. we'll talk again soon.